All right, guys, welcome to our second installment of Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. We'll be tackling book three in this installment. Um, and as you know, this is sort of C.J. Eller's discussion to lead, so I will hand the reins back over to him. Yeah, so, so now we're going to go into book three, and I don't know if I have much that's new in regards to what we already explored, but a lot of it is is digging back to what he was talking about in book one and two, which is about how we're part of this whole and that we have to direct our life within reason and justice and all of these certain things. And and one thing I wanted to note is that he does a lot of reminding to himself. That that seems to be one thing that he really does in this in this book in general. Or in, in in the meditations in general too. I, I can point out one part where he, he, he sort of gives himself a practice and he says, okay, look, here's what you gotta do. Train yourself to think only those thoughts such that in answer to the qu sudden question, what is in your mind right now? You could say with immediate frankness, whatever it is, this or that, and so your answer can give direct evidence that all your thoughts are straightforward and kindly. The thoughts of a social being who has no regard for the fancies of pleasure or wider indulgence, for rivalry, malice, suspicion, or anything else that one would blush to admit was in one's mind. So Stoicism, in a lot of sense, and we talked about this in the last podcast, is a philosophy of action, or it seems to be directed towards practice. And this is one example of Marcus Aurelius giving himself something to think about or to practice in his daily meanderings around Rome and wherever. And I, I, I think it goes with what we were talking about before about having, again, I, I keep using the word, but a directed mind and a directed life that you are not letting other thoughts of lust or of anger get in your way, but you are front and center about being a rational, generous human being. Mm. Mm. Uh, that, that was one thing that I, that I noticed that was quite fascinating and applicable to my own life, I suppose, yeah. in, in the first bit of book three. And that was something that, I don't know, maybe I'll use tomorrow and yeah. I'll say, you know, when I'm being a cashier, I say, what am I thinking about right now? Am I thinking about how angry I am at the person that's, you know... Counting out all their change? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or should I say, oh, no, it's okay. We're all part, you know, we're all part of the same whole here, so I should just relax and let you count. And I've been in that position before. And to you know, give myself a clearer conscience. And I think that's one thing I really like about philosophy and it's what you touched upon yeah. earlier, Jordan, that it is pre-psychology in a way where it's just like, okay... Let's think about what we're thinking about right now, you know, like metacognition, mm -hmm. right. and direct it towards something better. Right, and I think to your point about action, and this is what I like and also frustrates me about <laughs> Stoicism is um, this tension between action uh, being, you know, dr like acting with purpose, and mm -hmm. then this kind of almost like it's what it seems like is like almost like a passivity with providence. But mm. in terms of action, uh, there's like this one sort of aphoristic sentence that I really liked uh, from chapter five. In brief, you must stand upright, not be held upright. Yes, I love that. that um, that's true. So I kind of like how, and then also kind of. Um, dovetails nicely with his sort of rep it's it's repetitive but you know also useful of how he says that um, you know act in a way that is really serving the ends of like paying attention to your ruling center like everything else is just a diversion mm. and then you know, work simple. towards cultivating virtue and you know don't obsess with um okay like uh, chapter four he says don't like fixate on the impressions of others or impressions that you f form in your own mind because they don't serve any use to you like and, and what he, what benefit yeah. do they serve you and, and he bashes those people too because he he says you know talking about those people that maybe do that sort of thing or focus on the external not mm -hmm. their own he says so he disregards even the praise of such men or you know person should do that 
These are people who are not even satisfied with themselves. I mean, mm-hmm. ouch, that, that's, that's pretty bad. But I, I think it's great that you, you mentioned that, you know, oh man, it seems like he's drilling these things time and time again. But we can't forget, and this almost goes to our discussion last time about, you know, well, what the heck does he mean about the theology? What's his theology? What, mm-hmm. what is he doing that? This is for him. We're not. In t- we we're kind of, you know, looking at the diary of you know of the bigger brother or younger brother or somebody mm-hmm. that we're not supposed to, and that maybe a lot of this would make sense to him, or it's not meant. To, I mean, it's 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 so odd to think that this is not meant to be read by us, but we're reading it now. Right, we're almost like voyeurs in a way. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that mm-hmm. maybe he's doing that because he was going through a time in his life where he had to just keep staying to himself, like you're gonna die soon. You mm-hmm. better get yourself yeah. going, and yeah, I think that's yeah. Cool. And he directs the actions uh, in, in accordance with uh, quote the rules of right reason and with destiny and what is allotted to you and beyond the sphere of your choice. Mm. Do you have anything to add, Luke, to that? Well, I, I, I do. Sure. I'll see how I'll, you know. I'll <laughs> see what my what my notes dictate here, so I can sort of. Um, uh, add to what has been said yeah, already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think what is sort of interesting is, in, and CJ, you already sort of alluded to it, that there is a sense of urgency to book three uh, in a way that there may have not been in the first and second books. So, like, look, you got to get to it right now. There's no time for delay. I find this super interesting in contradistinction to the discussion that we just had. <laughs> that every person's present is of equal value. And if ultimately everything is reabsorbed into providence, well, then what difference does it make? Like, really, what difference does it make if I do get going on this stoic journey? Like, why shouldn't I just be a dumb animal? Like, if everything's just going to be reabsorbed into the universe? I mean, I guess the only thing is to really say that the brief period of time that you are a cognizant, higher conscious individual, you will expend experience some sort of contentedness from a mm-hmm. cosmic perspective. It makes no difference. It doesn't seem to make any difference. Like we're all subject to this fate. The only difference that it seems to make is that like maybe when you're an adult for like the brief little period that you're alive, you get to have some sort of simple contentedness. But then on the other hand, he says we have no future. We have no future. Why not give ourselves over? Why not give ourselves over to the base appetites and sensations? Mm -hmm. You know, like if there truly is no future, like so. Look, here's the thing: is that I'm, I'm, and I'm going to let Jordan jump in there and stop mansplaining to, or Luke explaining, or whatever I do. (laughs) But like, look, I think it's look. I think what Marcus really is 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 saying here is like, yeah, that's cool, cool story, bro. Like, cool. But like, I'm having trouble seeing how all these pieces fit together. Here's something, a quotation I think that like might help us, like, because we're just kind of like, like, like in a frenzy right now. Um, for your part, I say you must, in all simplicity and freedom, choose what is higher and hold to that. But the higher is that which brings me benefit. Well, if it benefits you as a rational creature, keep a keep a firm hold on it. But if it benefits you merely as an animal. Acknowledge, acknowledge this, this and, and with that arrogance remain, remain true, true to that decision, decision only taking only care, care, care that your examination is conducted, conducted on a secure basis. basis. Mm-hmm. What, 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 what do you think he's trying to say there? I mean, it I mean, almost it seems to me that he's saying you want to act like, like an animal act like an like animal always setting, setting it up, setting it up of, but, but by like by like a large extension, extension as a human you acknowledge the difference between animal, animal behavior, behavior, behavior and human behavior, behavior. Like, like, what, 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 what do you care, care? Like, what do what you care, care? Like, like ultimately the universe is going to have its way I mean I mean like like, like is it is the whole the point of this is to give us give us give us give us unique honor honor right 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 I mean can you really tolerate that sort of that sort of relativity it reminds me of maybe in our control, control is how we perceive our actions and the present moment. moment. And whether, whether we, we live to be 100, 100 or 27, 27 we, we all have equal ability, ability in some, some degree. degree. 
you know, I'm not saying like, you know, like mm-hmm. a baby might, you know, right. not, but, you know, I don't know, I don't know of any, like, I don't know, like baby books, or maybe there's like baby <laughs> Epicure, <laughs> yeah, 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 baby, uh, baby, baby Marcus Aurelius, or something like that, <laughs> that's yeah. pretty silly, but we, we all have an ability, you know, full grown adults, we all have an ability to control how we view the things that we can't control. And maybe that's what Marcus Aurelius is getting at. Maybe it's not so much relativism, like, oh, well, if I die, you know, younger or older, what does it matter? But maybe he's saying that we have equal control of of viewing the things we can't control. I don't know if that helps out at all. Yeah, I think it's helpful. I, mean, it's, 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 I think it's, the, the physics is just very difficult to get a handle on. That's... And he's not, he's not writing, I don't think he is writing yeah. a metaphysical tract or anything like that. He's no, writing no, no. to I, himself. I, no, no, yeah. he definitely isn't. So I think that's why maybe like we are getting frustrated with like... I'm not sure that he isn't. I mean... We, I think uh, he's like, I, I mean, I don't think that he's like, he's not... I think that he has the conceptual framework in his mind, mm-hmm. but he's just writing it without like he didn't have the intent to clue any readers into it really no because it's all in his head oh that's such a great well, we point don't, we it's don't, all in his head we, so can, why? We, can we really pass judgment on his intentionality or where this text is going I mean we've only covered the first three <laughs> books I, I've not read yeah. this entire book yet so I can't yeah. really say what it culminates in he may very well weave all these things together to create a palatial system of stoic practice and metaphysics yeah mm-hmm. I mean I just don't understand why he keeps keeps um, giving us sort of fragments of it if he doesn't intend to make use of it later. Or giving himself fragments of it. Yeah. It's all he needs. It's all he needs to just get himself to cope with an event or something like that. Because we think of, if we think of these metaphysics or whatever we're reaching out as, as coping mechanisms Mm -hmm. for certain events, like you were saying, Jordan, it was kind of like as psychology, Mm -hmm. then in some way they are helpful and instructive. But I think if we actually try to say, okay, well, actually, let's actually see, you know, if a world was like this, then maybe maybe they fall flat. But in, in a, pra- I mean, not to be pragmatic about it, but maybe that's how he's viewing it. He's not really getting too much into the details. And like you said, Jordan, maybe mm-hmm. he knows the details, but he's not gonna he's not gonna show his card because he's talking to himself. Right. <laughs> I actually think there are a lot of details. I think there are a ton, yeah. a ton of details. I. But maybe to, to I don't know. I'm not saying but like I mean, let's like, not bash in a, it. in a cohesive presentation though. No, yeah, maybe not. Because I think right now we're getting like patchwork, but we're just not quite able to fit it together. I'm not willing to say that we're getting patchwork. I think he may actually be giving us something substantive, I and mean, it's yeah. up to us to put it all together. Yeah. True. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe we can see later on, like you said, Luke, whether it's going to amount to something or not. And like you say, <laughs> we are kind or of. Or shout good. out to our listeners. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Throw us a lifeline if you've got it figured out. Yeah, but um, well, all right. So, look, and I also thought it was pretty curious that he says, like, look, you've got to have some urgency to yourself. You've got to comport yourself in a way that you actualize right reason and everything that you do. And they say you have a shoe, this uh, this meaningless opinion, this gallimatious, and that you don't get caught up in the pleasures and pains of the world. But mm-hmm. at the same time, you have to do this before you lose your capacities to comprehend it all. Yeah. So like, his, so like, he's, he fears old age. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's sort of like, like if ultimately you're going to be undone by these physical processes anyway, I mean, it's, I don't know, I guess it's sort of like this ephemeral sort of contentedness that right reason bestows upon you. And I wonder if it, if it is biographical because we don't know when these are written. So I don't know if he is dying of old age or that he is maybe like, like yeah, you said, Jordan, like witnessing, yeah. you know, his, his children die and saying, oh my gosh, you know, I, I'm... I'm getting older myself and you know people around me are dying or mm-hmm. something like that and and yeah and like you said there's just this urgency again and again and again and and just to even note another practice that he that he mentions which is uh, chapter 11 but it's the same it, it's almost the same thing that I mentioned earlier where he says always make a definition or sketch of what presents itself to your mind so you can see it stripped bare to its essential nature right. mm-hmm. and identify it clearly in whole and in all its parts and can tell yourself its proper name and the names of those elements of which it is compounded and into which it will be dissolved. And to me, that's a stoicism. Dare I say stoicism in a nutshell or one of its key components is, okay, this thing happened to me. Mm-hmm. Let's, let, let's, let's get into 
the thick of things here. Okay, let's let's talk about. It. So I don't know. Give me something, Jordan. Something bad happened. Quote unquote bad happened to me. Um, let's see. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many evils to. to you had your identity oh. stolen. I have identity stolen. Yeah, okay. there we go. So my identity stolen. So we have this idea of okay, my identity stolen. What does that? Why am I angry at that? Well, partially because my money could be taken away. Credit. Any what? C- wrecked credit. Wrecked credit with money in yeah. some way. So if it's purely financial and if money isn't, it is important in this world, but then mm-hmm. again, not necessarily important, then right. mm-hmm. if, if all my identity amounts to is money in some way or another, then why should I be upset? And this is another, uh, to allude to another Stoic, Seneca has this really odd, another practice i i can't remember what he called it but it was is this thing where he just said okay for a week or i don't know for a couple of days i'm going to live on nothing mm-hmm. like just and just do that to to know for myself that i can live like a poor not beyond poor yeah. and that i'm okay right so in some sense maybe your identity is still and you would say okay well if you, if you were practicing stoic, you know, yeah. and, and you lived on nothing, you said, well, if, I, if he stole all my money, I can live off mac and cheese for the rest of my life, and I'll be totally fine. I'm, I could be content with that in some way or another. But, I mean, it, it goes back to the psychology thing you're talking about, Jordan, where it's just getting at the heart of what's happening to you and realizing that and it's not even like everything's okay. I don't know if that's, you know, it's not like everything's I great, it's, I but it's... I think it's that. I think it's just viewing things as they are Mm. i think it's because he talks a lot about impressions yeah and to me that kind of makes me think about what is (laughs) what is our actual reality yeah you know i mean because the things that (laughs) you know is everything that i like sensory input and experience what is that all an impression of and mm-hmm. how do like what factor sort of mold so to speak like almost like a wax impression you know what I mean of what I'm living and experiencing sure. and, and feeling so it seems to me that a big part of what um, Marcus Aurelius is sort of rehearsing to himself is to try to strip away as many impressions as possible and he even and he even extols that as a virtue mm-hmm. in in the same chapter or chapter eleven where he says you know. Nothing is so conductive to greatness of mind as the ability to subject each element of our experience in life to methodical and truthful examination, always at the same time using the scrutiny as a means to reflect on the nature of the universe, the contribution any action, any given action or event makes to that nature, the value this has for the whole, and the value it has for man. And man is an inhabitant of this highest city, of which all other cities are mere households, which might go into the whole theology thing that we were kind of talking about before. But And it goes back to even the idea of the whole, too, where it's just mm-hmm. like a great mind is able to say, okay, what does this factor into the whole? And... And I wonder, like you said, if it's something that we have to explore, like what is the whole, what is reality? And does my identity being stolen even have that much of an impact on that reality right. as a whole? Or yeah, is it just I something that's so if you strip so everything small. down to almost its elemental nature, then can you start to kind of almost see like the, I don't know, the... Uh, the weavings of the universe if you can almost like see it in a sense of each thread for as it really yeah, let me let me let me, I mean, let, me con- not, yeah. Yeah, let me contribute something to that since we're going to talk about these these ideas of stripping away and sensations and impressions like it's yeah. towards the end there because oh, i think that interweaving the threads of <laughs> 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 right, this, this is pretty relevant this is at the end of book three mm-hmm. um and essentially he gives us uh uh three different sort of bits of information there in the last long passage um, he tells us that sens- sensations belong to the body, all right? And he says, appetites to the soul and the intelligence as principles. And so I thought this was a little bit confounding. So what's the difference between a sensation, an appetite, blah, 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 right? 
And what he says is that sensations are for animals. And, that, and, and Jordan, you'll recall what we did with right. Augustine. So, on, yeah, Augustine. Like, so these are going to be, I think, essentially the things that are sort of transmitted by nerve impulses or something like that. Mm-hmm. But the appetites, these are going to be for individuals that he thinks are for men who have no gods, for the, the bichol amongst us. They have enough intelligence to sort of orchestrate and bring about their sort of schemes and their desires. Say, like, I want to snare a beautiful woman or something like that, then I can go about creating this elaborate scheme to make that happen. Um, and then the intelligible principles appear to be for good men. And there's something about the pursuit of truth and, and, and justice or whatever, that these are sort of the foundational aspects of the universe. These are the, the, you're talking about this tapestry of what the universe is and what we make that, what maybe that highest city is or what maybe that organism is. I don't know if there's a bunch of shifting metaphor here or what's going on, but whatever those intelligible principles are of reason are, is like, that seems to be the fundamental reality for Marcus Aurelius as I understand him. What do you think? Yeah. I mean like, and then it all like tethers to the like supremacy of the, guiding spirit or like reason or intellect because if you can use your i don't know intelligible faculties to discern reality for what i don't know for for what it is <laughs> what like it then is. you can kind of see if you can start to see almost each pixel of the universe then you can eventually maybe piece together the whole universe wow. what do you what do you mean by that jordan oh uh, i mean I mean, like, what do you each... mean? What do you think it means to see each pixel of the universe? Well, it's kind of oh, okay. There we go. Got it. Um, I, I think of it in terms of Augustine with like sort of like the eye of reason, right? Is like you use that reasoning faculty. Um, let's see if I can. Um... Well, I mean, can are, I, can are I there the, truths of I, reason? Can I read the just the quotation? Please do. Yeah, Please yeah. Do. Um, they, I think, meaning like sheeple so to speak <laughs> have no idea of how much is signified by terms as stealing sewing purchasing being at peace and seeing what ought to be done for this is not seen with our eyes but through quite another kind of vision mm. so that different sort of vision then is the reason faculty i suppose or the... yeah is that the reason faculty that drives uh. our our actions i mean which i yeah, um, <laughs> this is a very no. confounding, yeah. frustrating. What's the what's the issue that you're struggling there with? Or suppose what what is this different sort of vision that Augustine is talking? I mean, Augustine, <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> that Marcus Aurelius is talking about. I mean, is it sort of like the vision of reason, right? And that that guiding that sort of that guiding principle or or spirit. Um, it would make sense in that way because Stoicism seems like a, a philosophy to cultivate that faculty mm. and see and see what what i think this so far and maybe he'll elaborate that on this in books four five and six and we're struggling we're sort of flailing about to define us or whatever but i mean i can see how augustine would directly lift this idea because then augustine's going to go through as in you can check out in our lecture and our other podcast and enumerate all the different truths of reason do you remember that when we did that jordan like there i believe the right. law of non-contradiction was in there i believe it was just like giving each person their due or there are a bunch of there i think we came up with like 13 like, of them or something like that yeah yeah or like so, a very long enumerated list of different like yeah the virtues like temperance I, and fortitude and yeah i'd be very i'd be very interested yeah. in knowing whether or not um uh augustine uh, was like look marcus aurelius you did a pretty good job you you you've you you you've you found you found some nuts here um but like look we've got to make some more like it's too scattered. We need to make some more sense of this, and then ultimately sort of schematizes it within his his Christian yeah. paradigm. Um, We'd have to look at the scholarship to confirm like what happened to this text. Though. Yeah, we have to see. We have to see. I think that there's definitely a Stoic influence in Augustine, but I think that it would be unwise to attribute that specifically to Marcus Aurelius. Hmm. Maybe. I I don't I don't know. I mean I, I we'll see. I, I don't know. I yeah, mean, I think that conceptually, yes, but... Yeah. I think Stoicism has a long tradition, and I think Stoic, it, it, it depends on um, where you link it back to and, right. and, mm-hmm. and all of that, but yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we Augustine was inti- yeah, intimate, intimately ac- acquainted with Marcus Aurelius. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, 
it's fascinating that we're talking about this because then it's kind of like okay like I discern you know, I have this discerning eye and I cultivate it and it's just like what does that lead to and at the end I guess at the end of, of book three he talks about you know people saying you know, oh that Marcus Aurelius he's such a eh, I don't like him and you know mm-hmm. those people that might not be fine with stoicism or who this person represents or whoever and he says you know and if all people mistrust him for living a simple, decent, and cheerful life, he has no quarrel with any of them, and no diversion from the road which leads to the final goal of his life, colon, to this he must come pure, at peace, ready to depart, in unforced harmony with his fate. We, we get this amor fati sort of thing at the end where, where one must love his fate or what what will happen to him or what his what his role is in the whole and perhaps to get that faculty or that different sort of vision going and to get all those pixels is maybe a way to then see that your role in the universe is such in such a way and that maybe you don't you can't discern it all the way but you know from what you've gathered that you can be fine with whatever happens, whether you die in a car crash or whether something terrible happens to you, quote unquote terrible, it's all within the universe. You've put it in the hands of the gods into fate. Like, I mean, I have to keep saying I'm more fati. You love the fate. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're ready. Again, he says, you know, you come pure at peace, ready to depart in unforced harmony with fate. Yeah, I mean, isn't the whole point of philosophy is to, is to learn how learn to die? Learn how to die, yes. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the end. It's true. Mm. And that maybe that's what Aurelius is getting at here. Because again, we, we keep getting this thing where she's like, you're going to die, get ready, you're going to die, get ready. You should be a little urgent here because you're going to die. And then yeah, like, at ready. book three, he says, well, be at peace when it comes. Realize that you've done, and, and maybe... He's not going to get everything done. Maybe he struggles with mm-hmm. with these precepts, but he's going to come peaceful anyway. Even if he says, "Oh gosh darn it, I didn't get to book four of, right. of my I meditations." Yeah, oh. no, exactly. But he's going to say, "No, that is fine because I." And I, and I don't even know if it, it it's bad to say that. At least I tried, but mm-hmm. at least I tried to cultivate this faculty of trying to take things as they are and to try to be a part of the whole so i don't know what you all thought of that final point of just being in harmony with fate at all or i I mean i think it's something that's been implanted there in the very beginning i I, I think again i i don't know my opinions really all that all that change from i think the (laughs) not a believer yeah look i look i might be i might be able to be converted to stoicism we'll see i don't even know maybe there's nothing necessarily incompatible about my current life view and stoicism itself in fact they might be absolutely essentially linked i think the thing that was very interesting to me as we close out here we haven't had any sort of conversation about it is the that that marcus aurelius does advocate a some degree of civil involvement Mm -hmm. he talks about their sort of like the individual that has properly sort of appropriated whatever this doctrine is mm-hmm. is going to be interested in the common interest or if they're ever sort of called on to serve they will just sort of step up to the task mm-hmm. um what, what do you what do you think his general sort of feelings are about that because we've talked about this whole these these two installments that we've talked about so far have largely centered around the theme of trying to understand what it means to to discipline oneself by the ruling authority of reason and bringing oneself into harmony with the universe um so that you can have some sort of blissful contentedness as you face death, right? Mm-hmm. We've talked about that theme mm-hmm. a lot. We've been trying to sort out like what exactly divinity is. Uh, we've talked about the multiplicity of ways that divinity is, but we haven't really talked about like how this affects other people and the arrangements of city states. And I that's think something it's, he, it's he cultivating had... civic virtue for a lot of um, towards like the end of the Republic. Um, I mean, stoicism. A lot of people could get on board with it because. Like the patricians served in the interests to a degree, <laughs> debatable. <laughs> um, but like Stoicism was a, a philosophy that a lot of um, people could get on board yeah. with, was because it did support the civic virtue of ultimately use your your rationality as like a greater cause than yourself, and something that is like self serving. 
Mm, I mean, so yeah. I definitely and I mean, if you think about it, obviously, like as an emperor, he's gonna this is gonna gel with him. He's gonna probably advocate something like this that says use your your temperance and your good judgment to help your subjects. Yeah, and, and that's something he touches on even in chapter five, where he says, you know, you should not take no action unwillingly, selfishly, uncritically, or with conflicting motives. And later on he says, Further, let the God that is within you be the champion of the being you are, a male, mature in years, a statesman, yeah. a Roman right. a ruler. One who has taken his post like a soldier waiting for the retreat from life to sound and ready to depart past the need for any loyal oath or human witness. That mm -hmm. the civil office is in some way linked to his fate and to who he is into the whole and that he has to take this not so much as a burden but as, as who he is. Yeah. And I mean, I, yeah. yeah, I mean action made your animus or your spirit manifest. So for the Christian mindset, we are passively given a soul. For the Romans, you fashioned your own soul. And it was by acts of will that you did this. So what better way to show acts of will than like valor on the battlefield or, you know, or an act of will in the Senate? Yeah, and I can I can attest to the example I used in the, in the Kierkegaard, the last Kierkegaard we did about Marcus Aurelius confronting one one of his generals who I, I think I got the story wrong but what but Marcus Aurelius was sick and maybe he was writing these during the time yeah. when he was getting really sick but one of the his generals tried to take over the throne and and declare yeah, himself one of his, yeah ruler. one of his generals said oh he's dead and yeah, yeah it was when he was um, a governor in Egypt pretty much and was like yep he's he's gone so Declare me emperor. So yeah. Marcus had to march and like clear all that up. But yeah, but then the, the key to that is that he said, "I'm not going." He could have easily made a fool out of this man and killed him in the worst possible way. But he said, "No, I'm going to forgive him mm -hmm. because that." Is what I should. I mean, that is what we say. You should take no action unwillingly, selfishly, uncritically, or with conflicting motives. Mm -hmm. To if if we wanted to even use his little practice and say, oh well, let me let me see. Okay, kill this guy that tried to kill me. Like, okay, what's the benefit? Um, well, we already you know he's not going to do it anymore because we stopped his forces. So what's the point of killing him? If not for my benefit, for being selfish and saying, look at me, I'm the best. You shouldn't right. mess mm -hmm. with me. Right. Mm -hmm. So then he would say, okay, well, maybe that's not right. And I should give this man pardon. And that that is something that within me, you know, within maybe looking through that different vision in his, in his mind, is that is a way to cultivate virtue and... And yeah, or just it seems like stoicism to me is using all, like you said, action, using action as a means to anything that you go through in life as a means to exercise this this different vision judgment. that we have, yeah, judgment and reason and stuff. And I don't know, that's something that I really, really enjoyed from book three, at least, is, is what he seems to be getting at. It's just using the world around you, and I, which again, it's like. It's a philosophy of action. Using the world around you as a means, as a lesson. The world is your school, and stoicism is your teacher, mm -hmm. and you have to... Act in it to learn. Act in it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's quite exciting. I don't know. That, that makes me... I, I can understand why people really enjoy... Or not enjoy, but take a lot of optimism and strength from it. I think the most edifying thing about Marcus Aurelius, I've, I've been listening, in addition to reading it, I've been listening to it on the audiobook. Uh -huh. I really have to say that it's quite poetic and it really needs, it, for anyone who's I've listening to it. I've read it aloud. <laughs> it's really great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say that um, there, this is as much a work of philosophy as a, is a work of art. Mm. And I would say any, any individual would be um, bestowed with great gifts if they had an opportunity to read it to themselves so you could hear the sweet mm. music that is the, the language. Or if you were able to go to LibriVox or YouTube or something like that and take it with you, um, it's it's um, 
And maybe, maybe so maybe it like occupy maybe in some ways it occupies like a mid space between philosophy and epic poetry in that respect. Um, look, that's a, probably a little <laughs> bit of a reach, but um, I don't know. I obviously have my prejudices that may be peeled off or maybe strengthened. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. you, you didn't you didn't like that you didn't like me saying that why didn't what? you like me why didn't you like me saying that oh I mean you're allowed to refute you're allowed to to, to um ha- I mean again me. like ha- would have to go back to the Greek that's why I'm like sorry though I, I, I might have flinched a little <laughs> yeah <laughs> a it's a great consternation for when I said that <laughs> um yeah I mean I'm yeah for me, I would just have to go back to the Greek and like look at it and like understand like look at scholarship of like the you know if there's like any meter you know all that good stuff. Well, we will. So I think in the <laughs> the, the future installments, we will sort of learn with you guys. We will probably each individually do research. I think um, by talking it out, we learned what we do not know about Marcus Aurelius as much as what we do know, and. Um, I think in different ways, like I have a, a, a million questions I have to do background research on Same that I, I sure. that I feel like we're sort of unresolved in our conversation, not because of any particular uh, feeling of any of Just us, but a like limit of time. <laughs> well, I don't know if really any more time would, would make it any more clear. I think really what I need to do, because I still think that I have these plaguing issues is to read deeper and further and to go into the secondary literature. And maybe what I'll do the next time that we get together, anything that I feel is still unresolved, I'll try to tie a bow on it at the beginning of it. Okay. Yeah. That's wonderful. All right. So does anybody else have anything to say? Um, I don't know. I think I'm, 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 I'm discovering more and more about why James Stockdale, as he was going out of his parachute, when he got shot down, said, you know, I am leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus in the sense that you are given this situation and you have to say, okay, how, how can I look at this? You know, okay, well, I'm shot down over Vietnam. Like, what can I do? Okay, I'm going to get captured. You know, I'm the highest ranking captured American. So what I can do, oh, you know what I can do? I can be a leader for the people that are in prison already. And I can, sh- mm-hmm. I can through leadership help my men who are also in prison and POWs and mm-hmm. get like who thinks of that you know what I mean you would just be like oh my god I'm going to die I'm going to die right. but he had this other mindset of again if we maybe go back to the civic duty part of thinking not even about yourself but just about the men around you and yeah, about you know like others. why am I why am I here how is this going to help in the part of the whole and it's, it's such a it's such a I hate to say practical, but it's such a profound and practical philosophy that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm falling in love with it. <laughs> slowly, and sh- slowly but surely. That's good. A little more convert. All right. Well, we'll do more prep and we'll fall more in love. More in love with Yeah, Marcus hopefully Aurelius. some things will become more clear to us because the more that we delve into the text, the more ambiguous and confused I feel about things. Yeah, a second date is needed. Yeah. And we shall have it. Okay. All right. I think that's it, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thanks for listening.